It is 7.02 on the 16th of October, the regularly scheduled meeting of the Board of Health of the Town of Dover. Uh, I am Gerald Clark, the chair. I'll let Joe introduce himself. I'm Joe Westone, a member for the last hundred years. <laughs> and Stephen, Dr. Dr. Stephen, Steve Crescott. So, um, the, the agenda, you have the copies, please. Yeah. Okay. Do, like uh, uh, do we want to, uh, since there are folks here because of the discussion of Colonial, do we want to bring that up forward? Or? Oh, well, let's at least get through the previous. Okay, well, yes, uh, in the minutes that were recently circulated, we have a copy here, and I suggest a number of. I see that. Errors that we need correcting. Do you want to defer that until the after, afterward then? Or do you want me to just to take those you can and, take my edits as and then put it in and send that. it out again? As long as we do that. Others agree. Yeah. So, so we'll, we'll we'll make, we'll, you'll make copies and Yeah, and I'll just recirculate it and then That's everyone's fine. in agreement. I don't want to take up the time for your home dinner. Okay. Does okay. so, that work for you, Steve? Sure. Okay. Now, I can I ask you, do you want to take items three and four, which are fairly standard, and hold those to the end? Sure. Okay. Um, J Karen, what do you have to say about yesterday and vaccinations? Let's get that on the record. Okay, so at the flu clinic, which was the most well attended that we've ever had, there were 145 shots given in the course of three hours, a little bit more than three hours. Um, we had 108 people who had registered. Um, of the 108, 89 um, came. We had 56 walk-ins. There were 108 regular doses, 24 high doses, 13 Just to clarify, PDs. that's senior. Yeah, yes. Regular, 24 senior, 13 Not PD, and one for the pneumonia shot. Not all seniors received high dose. Yes. But we did not know until the pharmacist was came in at uh, one that originally they were going to bring us 45 vials of the senior dose, and then they had cut it to 40. But ultimately, they only had 30. So the writing that he sent me was not correct. On that one. Was not correct. They brought an extra of the regular, so some seniors yeah. got it. But what we were forced to do, since we had to keep aside enough vaccines for all of the seniors who had pre-registered and identified themselves. So they really weren't enough. Um, seniors then had a chance to either um, get the regular dose, or, um, which some did, maybe eight to 10, is that what you'd say? Eight to 10 people. And then a few decided to leave and see if they could find it elsewhere or call their doctor. So that, that was it. Yeah, so that was it. So I want to get it on the record. This is the second year in a row, and it's the second year under the new management of Walgreens, which took over the Rite Aid in Norwood, that we've had difficulty. And this year, um, I executed a written contract with World Walgreens calling for the numbers of doses that you just mentioned in writing. Only when I was in Los Angeles on the, I believe it was on the 24th of September, you sent it to me to receive notification that they were going to be in breach of that contract because they weren't going to do some of the very specific actions that were called for in the contract. Such as the other vaccines. Such as the other vaccines and the quantities. Uh, so from Los Angeles, I introduced myself to the corporate entity to their public relations who forwarded me to the executive offices and the next thing we knew about three days later Norwood said oh we made a mistake of course we're going to do everything correctly uh, and now we come to find out that that didn't work out anyway moreover they only sent you didn't mention they only sent one person to administer the vaccinations which is a total change from all previous precedent which is why we had long lines of people and I just thank the residents who came in to, for having the patience to stand in line for up to a half an hour. So obviously we are going to have to think about this going forward for I next year. Something to think about. 
Well, I don't want to take action now. I'm just saying no, clearly it could change. How do these numbers compare to last year's numbers? Last year was a fiasco because Walgreens uh, completely failed to provide uh, the pediatrics. So there was a massive confusion on that. There was confusion all, all in all. Two what? years in a row. Two years in a row. So the numbers of people were vaccinated yesterday were probably triple what they were. It was significantly, oh, yes. higher, Why? significantly higher than we've ever had. Yeah. Why I'm asking that is something I, I realized yesterday as Why I was getting my phone. Sorry, Felix Zemmel, I'm the well agent. Um, one of the things I realized yesterday as I was getting my flu vaccine at my doctor's office was that the doctor's office, if you call and say, I'd like to schedule a flu vaccine, they are telling patients, sorry, we're out of flu vaccine, go to CVS or Walgreens. And, and I asked the doctor's office why that is, because I heard it multiple times that the, that the, um, the medical assistants were telling people on the phone, sorry, we, we're out of flu vaccine, we're, um, is the supply, I guess, is short. And, That's right. and they're only they're only giving it to people who are coming in for their physicals or or sick physicals. Well, they can triage however they wish, but supply is short. There's been increased demand this year, and there's been a markedly increased demand amongst the senior citizens for the higher potency vaccine. Yeah. And uh, a number of the local pharmacies had have already been identified as not having any of the higher dose vaccines. So our seniors, whom we had to refuse, uh, are going to have to scramble to find yeah. high dose vaccines. This is why it was very disappointing because as of last week, I, I did a canvas and was able to determine that the Medfield CVS, the Needham, Med, um, Needham CVS and Needham Walgreens were out of stock as apparently was the Walgreens in Westwood. So we're talking about the area ones. We're already out of stock. So Needham on Highland has stock, but it's not the preservative free one. I see. The Needham on Great Plain is out of stock. Right. That's Walgreens right. is in stock with with preservative free. Well, that, but that, that that's as of this morning. OK, I was gonna, that must have been a refill since yeah. last Thursday. Uh, and, and there was no question people were concerned. And um, I was less concerned because I had a written contract. Yeah. Only to find out that, once again, it was in breach. So that's the story on the vaccinations. I don't know if it's worthwhile next year doing the supplemental boosters in pneumonia uh, or not. Well, we can discuss that yeah. at a later date. You know, we didn't have much of a turnout. Okay, so that's that. Uh, Felix, you want to do it quickly on Wells? So it was, it was actually pretty quiet um, on Wells this past month. Um, I only did two inspections, two site visits. Actually, counting today, three site visits. Um, 95 Farm, I went out there a couple days ago. They're sinking a couple of irrigation wells. And 146 Farm was just a... Um, 146 Farm was um, just a flow test. Um, and um, that one was fine. What I'm noticing, though, or what I'm noticing is a big uptick in phone calls from people who are on Colonial who are saying, why can't we disconnect from Colonial and get a domestic well? And I've gone through our regulations and I've gone through all the regulations I can find. And I can't find it. I've been told by Mike and, and others that, that you can't do it, that you can only do an irrigation well. I can't find that in writing anywhere. If you will remember, and I, Karen and I were trying to remember when I opened this discussion, perhaps two years ago, um, I determined that there is no record in our office nor any record in the town clerk's office of any bylaw, regulation, or the like that established what essentially is a mode of practice and nothing more. Um, if you remember, we were looking toward a motion to accept customers of public well water supply companies to be able to install their own private wells. 
But then the discussion turned to, is there, as a result, going to be the risk to adjacent wells? And that's what stopped the discussion. But I would point out to you that that's the case in every instance when any property puts in another well or a new well and there are other wells in proximity. So what I'm saying to you is we're in a tenuous position trying to hold this because we don't have any record of any bylaw or regulation that says we are able to refuse issuance of an application for a well to any resident under any circumstances. I'd like to believe that we had a regulation in place because it certainly hasn't mentioned. Well, if you remember, Karen remembered, we discussed it about two years ago and the point was there is nothing written to substantiate that there is such a regulation. The only issue is cross-connection. You can't have both going into the same house. And that's state regulation. But if you decide to disconnect from Colonial. If there is no written regulation, there have been people who have approached us whom we have told that there is a regulation. And those people deserve some sort of redress. Well, the question I think comes up and it may not be something to proceed with tonight. Well, that's the question. Do we proceed on the basis that there is no actionable regulation? Or do you wish to enter a motion to in fact put in place a regulation that would become effective probably some three to four weeks from now after publishing? And I leave that to the two of you. You understood where my position was two years ago. I'm just hearing so many people calling saying they just don't think they don't want to go on Colonial anymore. I think this has to be discussed in a larger context in terms of understanding what sort of service Colonial has been currently providing. And we will get to that. So I just, there it is. I guess what you also made a comment about seeing ever increasing depth to wells that were being installed. Yes, I'm seeing them going down to over a thousand feet, well over a thousand feet. Do you know what the average has been historically by year? So the wells that are being decommissioned and the well drillers that are kind of newer to town are, they're used to 500 to 300 to 500 feet. And that's what I'm seeing is being decommissioned because they're not getting enough flow. In order to get more flow, they're either deepening the wells and fracking them or they're taking, the wells are on average going between 750 and a thousand feet. Do we maintain the statistic regarding that? I'm in the process of collecting it. We, again, this, we entered into a new data collection several years ago, but prior to that, it didn't exist. And we were dependent upon the state's well driller program and the DEP has openly admitted that they don't enforce the filing by the well drillers of the well reports. So it's a matter of catching up with the paperwork and enforcing what we have been doing going forward from several years ago now. And I'm working on getting the wells in this town file report. No, the well, yes, the well drillers. To us. They, they have been, since I started, I've been enforcing that they email me a copy of their report. And that's, that's exactly the point. That's what, when, when I brought Felix on, that was one of the issues that I addressed with him that we need to maintain historical records of all of these reports because we can't count on the state. We don't have records. So I can tell you the well at 95 farm that I did two days ago, they had two irrigation wells that they drilled. One was at 500 feet and was, and was drawing two and a half gallons a minute. The other one was at 750 feet and drawing, I think seven and a half gallons a minute. Just to give it a historical context, many years ago when Percy Lowe, who some people may remember, was one of the predominant well drillers here. He and Lester Whipple, it was typically the case that they were going down less than a hundred feet to find sufficient water. Grant you, in my memory, that's more than, that's five decades ago, but that's where we were coming from. And now you hear where we are today. Now it's not consistent throughout the town, obviously. And moreover, 
you have to understand that many of the newer wells are going into places where they're, in, in some cases, were not previously residences. And that may well have been because, in some cases, the properties uh, would have been more difficult to develop, either because of ledge or the like. So we, it, there are, it's unclear that there's a consistent story here, but there is clearly uh, the view that we're seeing deeper and deeper wells being necessary to produce this initial six gallons per minute volume. Um, the vast majority of the wells I'm doing are for new houses on new lots. So where there were no wells previously, and those are going really deep, and they're fracking uh, pretty much every single one of them. Um, today, I did a site visit um, with, with a driller and with the surveyor to try to assess the GPS location um, for a well that they want to drill up on Wilsondale. And I asked, why are you drilling it if you already have an existing one? And they said the water quality is, is not good at the, at the, with the existing one. They're having too many solids, um, too many metals that they're finding in their water. So they're hoping if they drill and drill deeper, that um, even with the presence of a deionizer, I didn't ask. So, as to the question of Colomio, I didn't find that we had a copy of this year's ASR current. We used to keep them on the, the reading board out there, and they've got <coughs> here. Do we have a copy of the, this year's ASR? Well, it's from what 18, because we wouldn't have it. Uh, no, it would actually. We wouldn't have. Yes, it may have been 18. Yeah. By now, it would have. Have we received the 18? I I don't recall because whether Because the question I, I was asked is, do we know what they are? So yeah, that's what I'm looking that to, up, Felix? That's what I'm trying to look yeah. up. Yeah. Because, because what's the latest one here, 17? It's gone. There are none there. Are none there. And I had made more copies. Yeah. So um, I know people, you know, people Because someone asked me, them. what does colonial test for? And I could only cite what the state in general requires, but I couldn't mm -hmm. go to the specifics of colonial because our all of the copies have been taken that I yeah I probably I, I have I have them but um. okay so on colonial and and I want to make clear in the public that this is not a, an attack on the company at all it's rather simply an attempt to state factually what has transpired over the past five years. Uh, the Water Resource Committee in the last two, but prior to that, I had been reviewing their Department of Public Utility filings, which are predominantly going to infrastructure and the cost basis, and the DEP filings, which are known as the statistical report. The, uh, and as it was reported, in a number of venues, whether it was the session in the library or in town meeting or in reports to the Board of Selectmen, there was a consistent story in which the company, Colonial, was issued a withdrawal permit in 2010 at the time of the effective purchase. And that allowed for a totality of drawing 140,000 gallons per day. To get a sense of that, if you use the state standard of 65 gallons per resident per day, and then try to figure out what the commercial draw is for the small amount of commercial, you, in theory, that should be sufficient. How many customers do they have? Uh, they report six, varying between 603 and 611 residences and I can look it up uh, I'd have to get online uh, 630? Yeah, 600, no, 603 versus 611 it varies depending upon which year you look at and even which page in one particular year because they weren't consistent in terms of total customers uh, that is to say all residents I want to say it's about 16 or 1800 heads, people. Yeah. Maybe less than that. As a 65 gallons per household or per person? No, that's per person. The state standard is 
RGMD, 65 gallons per resident per day. And that's what the state is trying to impose on all public water supply. So, the, so the draw allows them 2,150 gallons per person, per, uh, uh, per, per day. Uh, well, per, uh, okay, I, you're going to force me to pull this up. So. Annual. <laughs> Let me pull this up while I, I go further. Uh, because I, I have circulated these before, and uh, I guess we can just, excuse me, I have to get out of Boston University here, which is, that was the faculty meeting today, so. Uh, get out of Boston University and go to here. Dover Isles, Board of Health, Water. So I, I'm going to go to the analysis that I supplied to folks uh, back in March 2017, which I actually updated. Let's move things along. Well, uh, the numbers seem to say that they've got, if they're drawing that amount of water, they've got enough water to yes, service their coverage. I understand that. Unfortunately, that's not how it works. Because in point of fact, hmm. you have the water quality test here. It's actually quite interesting. Um, in fact, in two, I've been getting so many spam, spam calls. Um, in 2005, when they had 1,700 headcount, they were supplying, according to them, 83 gallons per person per day. Now, to do that, they were drawing, for the year, just about 63 million gallons, which works out to 170,000 gallons per day. The problem they have is that they were interpreting, for their own benefit at, when they were questioned, that the 150 from 2010 to March of 2013, that permit time, allowed them to draw 150 out of each of the two basins that they are permitted to. That is to say, the Charles River Basin, which is the Troutbrook, Knollwood, Francis Street wells, and what is we think of as the Ponset River, but the DEP refers to as the Boston Harbor Basin, and that is the Draper Street wells. The problem is the DP did not agree and then said, no, it was a totality of 150. And by the way, on March 2013, it was reduced to 140,000, 130,000 gallons. So they are limited at 130,000 gallons. So in 2015, they, they were 20, almost 25% overdrawing on a daily basis, or on an annual basis, 33%. Um, in 2016, it was a little bit less dire. They overdrew by 19%. Uh, and and, the, and it cons it's consistent. Uh, each, last year, they were in the same place again. Uh, I pulled some commentary that appeared in a bulletin board called Next Door. Oh, these are yours. Where did I put the next? Oh, no. Too many pages here. Oh, mm -hmm. oh here it is. Next Door. And as you may remember, Colonial on the Thirteenth of August was cited by the DEP, specifically Tatiana Kapenko, who works for Duane Lavangi, who is head of all public water supply monitoring and drinking water program, was cited because E. coli had infiltrated one or the other of the two Draper wells. Uh, they were it was pointed out to them that they did not have a state standard proper chlorination system. 
and that they were ordered to immediately shut these down and to, by regulation, had 24 hours or less to issue written notification to all their customers. We're all aware of the fact that they did not do that. Uh, we have two colonial customers here. I'm just curious, have you ever received official written notification of that contamination? So I can tell you I met with colonial water. Um, uh, you want to identify yourself? I'm Robin Hunter for the Selectman. So two weeks ago I met with colonial water. I met with um, Don Vaughn, who is the president. And I met with a newly instated Dover water operator by the name of Jake DeSantis. And the purpose of the conversation that I had with them was twofold. One, um, I wanted them to understand that it was not the Dover, the town of Dover's responsibility for them to notify their customers of um, contamination and that it was a regulation that they needed to abide by. And as a customer of Colonial Water, I went to their website and they had a document on there that was actually extremely useful. And I wanted to understand why that document was not emailed or mailed to all of them. May I get back to my question? So, Did you ever receive written no, notes? But I, Jerry, you allowed me to speak, so I just want to tell you I did not. Okay. I asked them why, you know, why they were not abiding with us, and they said that they didn't have email addresses or or a way to contact their customers, and I said that that was purely unacceptable to us, and I asked them to come back to a Board of Selectmen's meeting on 11-21, which they will be there, and at that time I expected them to tell me what their plan was for communicating to all of their customers within the 24 hours. Well, may I, now, I, I don't, let me finish what I was saying because I think it's going to fill in the gaps here. So that was on the 13th. By the 15th, um, since the folks at DEP and Dover Board of Health have been in communication fairly regularly on all matters of drinking water, not just any one company, Miss um, Karpenko uh, called me up. And then she said, well, why haven't you notified anyone? And I said, but it's not my job. I can't do that without an order. So she therefore on the 15th issued a state order to the Board of Health to make that notification, which was done by the email file, the email list of some 450 emails that the Board of Health has, as well as a posting on Nextdoor and a posting on the Dover Facebook page. Now, in fact, what you saw on the Colonial website not, was not posted for a number of days after the action by the Board of Health and after the action of Ms. Karpenko calling them up and asking what was going on. So on the Friday, and I don't know the date, when somebody from the DEP contacted the town administrator mm -hmm. about the E. coli, mm -hmm. he, my understanding is you had a conversation with him, and then he and I made a determination that even though it wasn't our responsibility to post something on the town. Yeah, that, that was the following week. And what we posted was the basically what had been posted. On right, the understood. Uh, I mean, actually, I have the, the correspondence file right here. So if you'd like a copy of the correspondence file. So, 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 so now, yeah, and Excuse I, me. Well, can I just respond to what something else you said? And that was, it, isn't it my understanding that they distribute monthly invoices to as many customers as right, they and have? I did, if you would have let me finish, okay. I did ask them, I said, you know, you have email addresses, many customers sign up. Why can't you use those email addresses? And he said that the billing system was separate from their, their system. And, you know, again, I wasn't, I just said, this is your responsibility. I need you to come to a meeting and tell me how you got, how you fix this. Did you ask him why he didn't use postal addresses? Which they sure did. I did. I said to him, well, he had to get it done within 24 hours. So there was no, 
Yeah. And here we are in October. Right. So he acknowledged they messed up, but okay. I said, you, you, I need to understand how it's going to be rectified. So this is one segment of calling of service to the town where users have found it unsatisfactory. Mm -hmm. And that puts that in context yeah. with uh, whether we should be deciding whether people can switch over. Yeah. If I could, then um, the other document that I pulled, and I, I grant you it is very biased, it's very self selecting. Uh, on the next door web page, um, starting on the 21st of August, Colonial published the following, and it reads. Please be aware that per DEP regulations, non-essential outside water use is only allowed two days per week from May 1st to September 30th, and no automatic underground sprinkler use is allowed. And it goes on, and it specifically cites between the hours of 5 a.m. and 9 a.m. Are those their regulations? Well, they say it's DEP. Now, since I... Doesn't the town have authority over No, no we can get to that. Uh, but since... I have been involved with the Commonwealth's Water Resource Committee and sat on the Drought Management Task Force. I can assure you that in the years 2017, 18, and 19, until this afternoon, there has been no state announcement or requirement as to the restriction of the use of water because until this afternoon, since 2016, there has been no declaration of drought status, nor would there have been any reference to 5 a.m. and 9 a.m. And as proof of that, uh, well, I'm picking up the wrong one. This is the, this is the draft regulation red line, it, but the full regulation runs even deeper that we've worked on since January. And I can assure you, now newly issued, the drug management plan doesn't cite days, nor does it cite hours, but it does cite conditions. And if a drug is declared, then it has extensive declaration as to what local, excuse me, what state government and public water supply companies are to do. And I didn't get a chance, I was trying to copy it, but the copier was acting up. Uh, there is only a minimal paragraph about local authorities, and I'd like to hold that off until later. But the answer is no. At the moment, the town of Dover has never accepted a home rule that would allow the Board of Health, as the body of standing, to issue a regulation as to restricting whether it's outdoor water use or other activities relating to public water supply. In other words, Colonial has on its own set up restrictions on for its users without any state regulation. That is absolutely correct. And of course, to mandate that. that's correct. And the uh, and by the way, until they posted it here, it's my understanding the only place you would have found this was in a one liner on their invoices and on their website. And they only put that on uh, several months ago. I assume users are unhappy with that. Well, th that's why, I, I, let me just cite what's here. Uh, it's clear the hours of 5 to 9 are, you should pardon this, when everybody's taking a shower. Uh, I'm not going to cite the names of the people who, who posted comments, but what is very consistent, separate from the contamination, is the issue that people are citing at, in writing as they have by voice to us repetitively that the water delivered, and I want to be clear, we're talking here about the finished water, not the raw water that's drawn. Those are legal terms. But the finished water delivered to some customers and I don't have specifics. We we don't we are not in the in bed with Colonial. We're not looking at their internal records. But many customers report turbidity, uh, excessive total dissolved solids, which will of course result in uh, particulate material surfacing on solid surfaces. 
as I say, turbidity in the water. Uh, we've heard and we have written comments here of coloration and of odor. And more importantly, uh, the dates of 21st and 22nd and that weekend all go to when there was a small, and I point out a small failure in the system, and many customers suddenly lost water for, I'm not sure how many hours, but enough hours to be a bother. And what it once again cited was the concern that this board has discussed and discussed with the DEP as to whether or not even overdrawing as Colonial itself reports, it has sufficient volume for its cu current customer base. And again, I want to cite, that's even as they are in violation of the terms of the withdrawal permit, which they report because they don't want to misrepresent that. There's one other thing that I think customers should understand about the contamination. Mike Angieri and I pulled out our rulers, went to maps, and find it curious that what is known as the zone one protection area, which is typically 400 feet radius from a well that's used by a public water supply company, on the reports is 343 feet, as I remember, which the DEP has accepted as reasonable. But the Draper wells were put in after the establishment of pre-existing houses, which of course, each of which had pre-existing septic systems. And as far as we can determine, and I don't want to cite a specific number, but I can assure you they are not 334 feet, the wells separate from existing houses and septic systems, and I think that's something that will be pursued further, but not by us. Okay, Robin, you have a comment? Right, so I had mentioned that my conversation with them was two both, and the two items that I wanted to discuss with Mr. Vaughn and the other operator. So the second item was I, too, am a member of next door, and there were, I don't know how many people, it could have been one, it could have been two, um, I, there was conversations that were about water outages. I am a colonial customer. I have lost water once for 10 minutes on a Sunday morning. How about the Saturday on Cedar Hill and the, up in High Rock? Are you part of that? Yes, group? I'm on High, High Rock. And, um, and I talked to the town clerk. She's, she's on over um, on Rolling Lane, so she's lost water more frequently than me. Bob Springer, who's on Francis Street, has never had an outage. And John Jeffries, who's on Meeting House Lane, has never had an outage. So, you know, I'm trying to, I was trying to determine, I saw the complaints of the 600 households, how many have not had water. So I did talk to them about the outages and the explanation that they gave me. And again, I asked them to come to a meeting so it would be televised, was that they put some monitoring systems on the infrastructure that they have so that they can better monitor on chemical levels and they automatically shut down the system. The issue that they had was they had two, two operators, one that lives at Fall River and one that lives 20 minutes away. When the Fall River operator was the one on duty, it would take two hours for him to come to Dover to reset the system. So um, what I said to them, well, why didn't you think about being able to, to call, you know, remotely put the system back online? So that was something that was being put in place now. So those were the explanations that I got. You know, the, the operator, the Dover water operator, he seems extremely knowledgeable. He's been a water operator for a bunch of years. He has a degree in water management. Um, you know, he gave us his cell phone number and he said, you know, the town could contact him directly if there were any complaints. So again, you know, all I could do was ask the questions that I had and ask them to come to our meeting and report back their plan for violating you know, um, their, their requirements to report 
and also to discuss why they have why some of the customers have experienced water outages. So so far I think there's been at least four reasons noted why people might be unhappy with their service right. and request to get back onto regular well. Right. And I did tell Ms. Vaughn, I said to him, you know, I don't know what how many customers are unhappy because again I don't know how many people are posting on um, on next door. But I said to him from from my perspective, you have a huge PR issue that you need to address because you do have some amount of customers that are unhappy and and if you are experiencing outages you should notify your customers as to why as a follow-up to that uh the weekend of the 22nd i believe it was 21st 22nd of what month? August, August. when the outage occurred um, my phone rang i'm not sure what people expected I, but so uh, trying to get a grip on what was going on, I actually came down here, pulled our map of where the colonial infrastructure is, which streets it, the pipes are in. That doesn't tell me who's connected. I, we don't have that information. And that was proven to me because I made about 30 phone calls randomly amongst those streets and many people said we don't know what you're talking about but others said yes it's been out since last night or it's out now or it's back now so but i can't do a scientific study because i don't have any information on the customer base it's not your responsibility correct to on your so i you know the board of selectmen's office has not gotten direct calls so if you're getting calls have you contacted colonial have you let them know that their customers are I put in a call, got an answering service, uh, and called in. Um, I will tell you that at the September meeting, um, I didn't even raise the topic, Dwayne Lavangi did. And last Thursday at the Drug Management Task Force meeting, I have to tell you I was shocked. Because out of left field, uh, a Marcos Parito of the DPU turned to Dwayne and two other people of the DEP, and I'm quoting now. This is a quote. Unsolicited. He said, what are you doing about Colonial? I, I have to tell you, I, I didn't know who he was, so I certainly hadn't talked to him. So is this... Uh, apparently, people had contact. Public meeting? Oh, of course, yes. There's no such thing as a closed meeting. So I can tell you, I have had, whether it was at 8 a.m. Boston time, when I was in Los Angeles and had a 48-minute conversation with Dwayne, or subsequently, as it stands now, the permit, which was issued in 2010, which is public record. I've circulated that. If you're not familiar with it, it called for that reduction from 140,000 gallons across the two basins to 130,000 gallons per day across the two. But it also called for a number of explicit conservation measures to be put in place. I can tell you that none of them have. It called for consumer education as to conservation. I'm not aware of anyone ever being educated by Colonia as to conservation. So Dwayne and I discussed all of that, and it was actually a very friendly conversation. Uh, and then he informed me that, just up so people can understand, all of the permits from all of the public water supply companies are technically expired because the state stopped renewing them some five years ago, pending a reevaluation of process and therefore extended them ad interim. 
In Colonial's case, Duane had given them notice that they had to submit a complete new renewal. This is not my doing. And he set a date, and I'm sorry, it was 5 o'clock in the morning, and he didn't remember last Thursday himself when I asked him if he could remind me. It's either November 9th or November 13th. They are due to submit a new filing requesting a new permit authorizing them to operate as a public water supply company. He, quote, fully expects them to request an extension, unquote. We discussed that, and he indicated that based upon commentary that he is aware of, it would not be a long extension, and I don't want to go further into the details. Isn't that subject to public hearing? No, that's his procedure, not us. It had nothing to do with us. But when they're renewing their request for a permit, isn't that subject to an open hearing? It may be. I don't know what the rules are in that regard. I haven't dug into how the DEP pursues their process. I can tell you what happens is it lands on either Tatiana's desk or ultimately on Duane's desk. They evaluate it, and I suspect in this case there probably will be a public open comment period. I would expect that. Do they have any language in their permit, previous permit, that prevents their customers from leaving them? If you would wait, I'll pull it up. Okay. I don't remember that such exists. It's been a long time since I read it word for word. Okay. Permit. Permit is very extensive. See, they filed on December 9, 2010. That was when they opened it up. You want to know the truth? It's going to take me forever. From my memory, there is no provision for, and in fact that. We need to know whether their customers are allowed to opt out. Well, Mike and Jerry and Felix and the three of us discussed that, and it was more, once again, our concern, Mike's concern, that if people dropped off of the system as it is established, it would reduce the customer base. It would, of course, not reduce their operating or fixed costs, so the divisor would be smaller. So there's that aspect to it. Robin, you have a contract. That expires next year. I mean, can you read that contract and see if you're. Oh, the board of selectmen? No, you personally. No, you personally. I just get a bill. I don't know if I have a contract. Do you? No, I'm certain. Well, I can certainly circulate the contract. That's not a problem. No, the town of Dover has definitely has a contract. But that's a contract that's only assigned to Duane. Right. 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 Right.
He promised that he would be available for discussions. That has never happened. In July of 2017, Mr. Vaughn, on video camera, made a number of statements in response to questions that were problematic. I mean, my only suggestion was they're not, you know, they do supply 30% of the households in Florida, and we do need to have a good relationship with them. And I think that's duly noted. The problem is we have individuals in town who view, take a view that they have individual freedom to opt out if they're not bound contractually. And it appears that they may, that they may be, and that... Well, and we have no regulation, the Board of Health has no regulation to stop them. And I don't think it needs them to opt out to make a difference for them. I mean, they're probably irrigators. Someone's got to think, well, I know somebody who, you know, their first year, first part of the year here in Dover, got an $8,000 water bill as his first bill. And so he and his neighbor sunk a well. So they're still colonial customers, but they use probably under 65, you know, gallons a day now, or probably somewhere in that range. I assume they sunk an irrigation well. Yeah, they sunk an irrigation well. But that well, obviously, it has to be potable, from what I understand. Yes, correct. It's kind of important. I mean, the big chunk of the money that, you know, they were paying to Colonial is not there any longer. And Colonial has, you know, an incentive for people to over, to use as much water as they do, because their rates go, you know, they're tiered, so they go up. Well, they have an incentive to use, have people use as much water as they're allowed to draw. And then some, since there's no real regulation. The fact is that they're overdrawing, but that's not our business. Maybe the town's business. Our business is to respond to the people who want to leave their system and have their own wells. And we're fact-finding now to understand how we're going to decide on that. But they can, they create the same damage if they're sinking their well for irrigation and staying on Colonial. I mean, the difference in how much water they're going to use is going to be significant. I mean, they're going to pump water up to irrigate, and they're going to get some water from Colonial, even if they stay a customer. Some of these people that I've had casual conversations with are interested in going out entirely. Okay. Yeah, that's, I just, I don't think it's necessary for them to, you know, for it to be a problem for, like, their neighbors. May I introduce? I think the point you're trying to make, which is a really valid point, is the overarching desire of the town and the citizens of Dover is to reduce consumption. You're not going to, you can't penalize just a subsection of the town by enforcing those conservation measures only on Colonial customers, because those people that don't want to abide by it are just going to throw the irrigation. I'd like to address that. I'm going to bring it up later. I apologize. The coffee machine didn't allow me to hand out this verbiage. Since January, in attendance with and by email correspondence, a number of us had been working on what is now known as the September 2019 Massachusetts Drought Management Plan Preparedness and Response. Most of it addresses the state and the large public water supply companies. And what you said about Colonial, Mr. Cahoon, of being in the business of selling water is even more to the point when it comes to the MWRA, who sees its mission as the business of selling water, which is in contrast to what most of the rest of the alphabet soup of agencies on the Water Resource Commission believe. And they believe, the alphabet soup and we believe, that conservation is necessary. So that being the case, for most of the state, 90% of the state, the 90% that are serviced by the MWRA or one or another form of municipal water service or water district or large water company, this lengthy document is actionable. When it comes to something like the town of Dover, 
it has finally been recognized at the state level by enough voices being that municipal governments are important. So I'm going to read this. This relates to local, legal authority of local governments. For the record, it's section 10.1. It appears on page 57 of the finished plan. If you want a copy of it, you can go to the Water Resource Commission webpage of the Commonwealth. The link is there for this plan. And it reads, municipal governments are critically important to manage drought, assessing the impact of drought conditions and using their authority to respond to the impacts. Municipalities are authorized to adopt and implement bylaws or ordinances in appropriate circumstances such as during a drought. Municipalities may regulate through such bylaws or ordinances the use of water from public or private water including voluntary or mandatory water use restrictions. When determined by MassDEP that an emergency exists in the case of a drought or a disaster, a municipality may, following appropriate notice, regulate or otherwise restrain the use of water on public or private property, regardless of whether the source is public or private. Pursuant to General Law, Chapter 40, Section 41A, even in the absence of an established bylaw or ordinance. Additionally, once a state of water emergency is declared and MassDEP has approved a plan to address the emergency, the operator of the public water supply system may take by eminent domain the right to use any land for the time necessary to use water on that land for addressing the emergency relevant section of law, Mass General Laws, Chapter 21G, Section 16. Municipalities, particularly those that experience chronic water shortages, are encouraged to promulgate bylaws or ordinances to address necessary rules for responding to an actual or threatened drought condition. A model water restriction bylaw is provided, and it's provided in this. Now, the problem I have when I went to Mr. Dwelly with the model bylaw was the realization that Unfortunately, Dover never adopted a home rule authorization for the Board of Health, who is the body of standing in this plan, to issue such a regulation. So he and I discussed that, and that may be something that arises at next town meeting. Now, I would just mention the following. I said this to Chris last Thursday when I got back, or Friday morning when I got back from downtown Boston. Because last Thursday, the Drought Management Task Force recommended to the Water Resource Commission, and the Water Resource Commission did indeed vote in, in a unanimous manner to issue to the Secretary of Energy and Environmental Affairs the strong recommendation that the Secretary declare a state of drought. This afternoon at 3.50 p.m., I received from Bandana Rao, I can never get her name right, she kids me about it, that it reads as following. And this is, she wrote to us, to those members of the Drought Management Task Force. Dear DMTF members, thank you for the discussion and for providing valuable advice at our meeting last Thursday. Based on your recommendation, Secretary Theo Haridis has issued a press release declaring a level one mild drought in the Connecticut Valley region and normal conditions elsewhere in the state. Sounds good, right? It's not here. It's not us. I'm continuing. With particular attention being paid to the Deerfield, Nashua, Nashua, Boston Harbor, and Housatonic watersheds. The point to that is there is concern that the Boston Harbor watershed is close to a stage of drought. And that represents one of the two sources of water to residents in this town. 
So that if you would like, I can forward this to you. Um, it's pretty precise and pretty clear and was expected based on the discussions last Thursday. So yes, I know we've had a lot of water coming down and we can talk about that at another time. But the fact of the matter is the appropriate authorities in the state using what has over the last three years been a mind boggling process of coming up with metrics so as to be able to declare when a drought exists have in fact reached that determination for that section, which happens to include the Quabbin Reservoir Basin and the, Hoos and the Housatonic, uh, Qua uh, the Wachusett Basin. So there we are. As I say, um, I, I'll just mention the names of the parties. Marcos Pareto, P-A-R-E-T-O, at the at DPU, and Duane, D-U-A-N-E, Levangi, L-E-V-A-N-G-I-E, at Massachusetts Gov. Uh, at the DEP. Those are the people in authority. Uh, the, this board at this time lacking an emergency, which now under this provision we would have authority, uh, does not have authority. Subject to passing a home rule, granting that authority for us to have a regulation. I don't know what more there is to say about it. So, I mean, I would just offer that if there are items that the Board of Health feels as though Colonial hasn't addressed, and if you would like to send a list of those questions to Chris Dwelly, we could make sure that those get responded to when they come to our meeting on November 21st. Recognizing, of course, that we're simply forwarding that information that residents have submitted to us or posted it's not very uh, again i'm making the offer no i understand what you're saying that, and would like to be, that you would like to be addressed right. you know i i also had the same concerns my when i addressed them with them i said it wasn't scientific it right. was just hearsay I, I will tell you that it's my intention to view with note paper and pen the 2017 July appearance of Mr. Levanji and call out those statements, which at the time I had believed and thought and opinion were problematic and bring those to you. I can assure you that one very specific statement that was made, I discussed on Thursday with the outgoing director of the Interbasin Transfer Act within the DEP. And she, I will simply say she didn't understand how the statement could have been made. And it related to the ability to fulfill the needs of consumer demand by drawing water from somewhere else. And it was stated in explicit terms on the video. That happens to be a matter of state law. All right. Well, we'll accept your invitation. So there we are. I, I will say that, that to my, that, what? Do we need a vote to no, that? I, so. I will say to, uh, to you that we will have tomorrow the response to the seven questions that Chris Duelli raised. Uh, I think the board is well aware that we had to suspend the operation of the Board of Health's Water Resource Committee, which was about to do water quality testing of the full 14 monitoring wells, which do not serve as potable water, are on town-owned land with permissions granted. And you will get the answers from two recognized professionals tomorrow. I would like to have more information stated for the record regarding that particular aspect? All I can tell you is the original proposal as enunciated at several forum meetings before the town meeting, documented in slideshows which are still publicly available, 
as stated at town meeting on videotape with slideshows, clearly enunciated the intent to do water quality testing. There was open discussion between Ron Myrick, a professional who is on the committee, with a number of citizens who raised question about water quality testing. It's all on the videotape. And I believe he satisfied them, including at least several who said, why aren't we doing it? And therefore, we always had intended, it's right in the slides, from a year and a half ago or more. We discussed this in, I believe it was June before the Board of Selectmen as part of a report. And we were going forward, and I'll, albeit I will admit that because of questions about what we should be testing for and should we combine it with testing for what we require of potable wells at residences, we delayed getting started until we could resolve that. And we had it scheduled for Thursday, no, Friday the 26th of September. The contractor, the consultant, had reserved personnel, had reserved equipment, had reserved a subcontractor. They were ready to go. And at that point in time, I received notification from the town administrator while I was in Los Angeles that it was required that we cease that until some time forward. A discussion was held with the town council, who was very concerned about contamination. I, I can't state why she would be. I would assume it's because she's been dealing with the real trail discussion and its different type of contamination. And I wasn't prepared while I was trying to get things going out in Los Angeles, including, and I don't know where my hat is, my EPA hat, uh, to try and address it. I mean, I, you caught me unawares literally 24 hours or less before we were about to commence. And thus, it at this moment remains suspended unless we believe we have the right and approval or at least acceptance by the Board of Selectmen to go forward. I will tell you that anyone that I have spoken with, including professionals at, at the Commonwealth, the biggest concern is to a great extent the false science that has been published in the Boston Globe and many other newspapers, including the Cape Cod Times, about the so-called forever chemicals or never-ending chemicals that come under the category of PFAS, PFOA, and PFOS. Do we want to get into that now? No, I'm just saying, and I think that's been the biggest concern, but just so everyone understand, the state will, by December, have issued standards on that. At the moment, there are no standards. We don't know anything. That's that's where we are. May I just say something? So I would just like to clarify the Board of Selectmen's <laughs> position. The question we asked was, if we tested positive, if there were high, you know, test results, what would be our fiduciary responsibility? What potentially would we have to do? What could the cost be? And, you know, is there a circumstance under which you would have to shut water up to everybody? Oh my God, where did that come from? So those were the questions. Well, the Not to us. Really Hi, Jerry. Those were the questions we asked. No, no, I'm sorry. Not in those words and certainly not in the substance of what you just said. Well, and I attempted at the time to say to you that you had essentially no liability. You know, right. And I think you know, we did not have a professional who was hired by the Board of Selectmen give us an opinion that said we had no liability. So you know, I think it was, I still believe all we were doing was out of diligence. Mm -hmm. I, and, and nobody ever, nobody ever questioned the authority or the authorization of the study. We just asked for clarity on some answers to, to that I, I, question I, regarding liability, I, which is why we submitted those those questions to you. And, I, and I believe it will be rectified. Well, at the time, the at the time I forwarded you.
comments by Felix and Ron, which I'll summarize as saying, there is no practical way anyone can guarantee you there is, under any circumstance, no liability. Right, and Ron made it clear in the comment, in the email that he sent back, that he was not a lawyer and he could not opine on a liability. Understood, but from a professional standpoint, what has been clear is, and I don't want to go into what we'll say tomorrow, I'll just say that, in general, it is the opinion of the professionals on the Water Resource Committee that it is a limited scope of possible contaminants that may be found that are, in fact, already reported, therefore not the responsibility of the town, and that, in any case, finding them, unless it was in such enormous amount as to be actionable, which would therefore immediately call into question all of the wells surrounding, to which the comment was made, wouldn't you want to know that? Well, nobody's saying you wouldn't want to know that, but what's the plan if that were to happen? You should ask the question. Unless you can cite what it is you're going to find and where you're going to find it, you can't really say there's a plan, because the truth of the matter is these 14 wells are independent of any private well other than they're drawing upon neighboring groundwater, and therefore it's impossible to know what you're going to find other than to have reasonable expectation on past history that you're not going to find anything with the exception of possibly MTBE. Well, that's what a phase one study is. And, you know, I just don't think the question we asked was unreasonable, and I believe that after the meeting tomorrow, we'll get the answers we need, and, you know, we can move forward. The most important part of the water study was to get a baseline level of water, which, you know, based upon this conversation today, is imperative to us. You know, we're hearing people have to dig deeper, and that's really important to the town, and that was the premise for doing the study, no longer having anecdotal evidence, being able to point to baseline data and saying this is what's happening to the water table, and we need to be prudent about conservation. And this is why two years, more than two years ago, I started suggesting this to the Board of Selectmen. I thought it was imperative. Yes, we see it now, but I differ with you in that the authorization of town meetings included water quality testing. Please. Nobody's questioning that. Please. And the issue isn't your right to raise the questions you did, but you had almost a full year to raise those questions. You had the ability to raise those questions after town meeting. You had the ability to raise those questions after I reported to you last spring, and you did it literally within 24 hours of commencing the testing. We also weren't informed regularly of your plan and how the study was unfolding, so perhaps if we got more regular updates, we would have asked the question. You know, Jerry, I don't say, you know, there was a lot of give and take here, and, you know, the communication isn't the best sometimes, and, yes, we came in at the 11th hour, but I think we have a right to ask the questions. I agree with that. You have a right to agree. But, by the way, but when you say there weren't regular reports, nothing from the spring report. Jerry, you have a meeting going on here, and this isn't on your agenda. Well, it actually is. It actually is on the agenda. And pointing fingers isn't going to do anything. But you just made a statement that you weren't receiving regular reports. There was nothing to report that differed from what had been reported to you previously. Well, as far as the timeline of when things were going to happen, sometimes when you know things are remnant, you think of the question. I mean, you certainly were notified of when we were drilling the wells. And we didn't have an issue with that. And the follow-on test was clearly documented as... The week of when the testing was going to occur. Ask the question and could I get an answer? I'm sorry. You got me in L.A. and I wasn't prepared to go. And that's fine. 
you know, this is why we're having this discussion. Okay. At the end of the day, we need to do what's best for all. Can I tell you what certain townspeople's perception is of what's transpired? And that is that information that they wanted to know as a result of the Globe article, whether scientifically correct or not, is being withheld from them, even though it would have been available as per contract. And, and with the delay in testing for quality of two weeks. Is, an, is, is incurring an increased cost. Which will be longer than that, because we have to restart the whole process. We're incurring an increased cost. And I think it would have been acceptable to deal with whatever was found, just rather than to seemingly obfuscate uh, what f findings they may occur. Just the fact of the matter is, the action also has already resulted in an almost $2,000 extraordinary cost, which was not part of the warrant expenditures disclosed, was not attributable to, to the plan, and, and we're out there with that cost, and we, we aren't in the position where we can start up to on Friday if the Board of Selectments on Thursday says, gee, I guess you've answered our questions. It is going to take weeks, if not months, to get back to schedule because we're dealing with outside contractors who are fully booked. And, you know, just to reiterate, nobody's trying not to get the information out to people. Do you want a discussion of well, this perception is among certain people in public that the selectmen are covering their rear ends. No, I don't know about that. Regarding this. Well, we need to, you know, we have a fiscal responsibility to the town. And if we have questions that may potentially arise that will cost money to the town, I, I think it is our responsibility I, but to, to suppress the gathering of information and the publishing of information. All that, I'm saying. telling you that's how well, it's perceived. I, well, I well that's saying. incorrect because all we asked was, can we just get answers to our questions and then we can move well, forward? Nobody I, said not to move forward with the test. I, I think one thing that's come out of this that should be on the record um, I had arbitrarily made the decision based upon the rather poor science that I was reading in the various public press articles. And I've been attending these meetings, and some of them have been exceedingly boring, argumentative over tolerance levels. I arbitrarily made the decision that we would, in two specific instances, test for these chemicals. It's an extraordinary cost that we saw the opportunity, we could in fact cover those costs. It's very expensive. Now, in point of fact, I've now suspended that part of it altogether because the truth of it is, the areas of greatest concern with regard to those chemicals are the schools. And the region is supplied water by Medfield Municipal Public Water Supply Company who is obligated when the test standards, the state standards are issued in November or December, will be obligated to test and publish those. So I don't have to worry about that. And the Chickering School is supplied by the Dover Water Department, a public water supply company owned by the town of Dover with town-owned well supporting that and is similarly regulated and will be similarly, similarly obligated to make such public report to the DEP. So I don't have to worry about that. So at that point I said, okay, I'm not gonna bother. I'm not sure I followed everything. Well, I mean, it seemed to be, as, as Stephen said, that there was considerable concern, unfortunately, retributable really to a lot of junk science, but the people, you know, that's out in the world. And therefore, we wanted to address that and explain to people what would be the concern, if any, what would be the exposure, if any, what we thought might be the sources, if any. But the truth of the matter is, it wasn't in the original Article 14 explicitly these chemicals, because this didn't come up until this January in the first state open discussion, January 10th, if I remember correctly. So 
we had a list. We supplied it in writing to you. I sent to the Board of Selectmen an Excel spreadsheet that clearly enunciated what the Board of Health tests, asked for testing by citizens when they either put in a new well or when they transfer the title of a property because we want to catch it at that point. We don't want to be onerous and require everyone to test their water every year, but it's a moment in time. One side of the Excel spreadsheet listed those. What we intend to do on the monitoring wells is a very small subset of that. Very small subset. And that was presented to you, and if you want, I will pull up the spreadsheet and when it was transmitted to you, but it was transmitted months ago. And that's what we told you we were going to be testing, and you had notice of that months ago. In writing. I guess I'll have that available tomorrow with the transmittal date. If you feel it's necessary. Well, I don't know. You've said I didn't keep you up to date, and I'm scratching I my said, head saying. Barry, I said perhaps the information didn't flow properly. You know, it, it, it happened. We raised the question. We delayed the start of, of the testing. We are where we are, so let's fix it and move on. Well, you will from two professionals tomorrow. And, and I greatly appreciate you getting the information for and, us and, and responding and the, to the questions. The questions right. will have responses. I don't know that you'll like them because the answers are not guarantees. It's good to do your diligence. Okay. Have we done on this? So I guess the board should really research further the question of whether or not we, and it's not tonight, whether or not we want to address the private well, own, excuse me, the private residences who are requesting and continue to request their opportunity to put in a well of their own over for potable water as opposed to irrigation. Um, I, I don't know do you, I, I, I'm certainly not suggesting we entertain that motion tonight, but if you guys want to, I guess we could. I think we have to have the actual I think it requires further. I, I agree, I agree. So that's something we'll have to address. And, and again, I, I openly state that my concern if we do that, if we do that, my concern is that if you take the total ex, ex cost of operating any of the public water supply companies, any of them, and to divide by a smaller number of customers, in order, there's no question it will be a more of a burden, and ultimately more of a burden on the consumers. And that's well understood. Sure. Question. For because what you're talking about is a potential rate increase if the denominator goes down. I'm not going to, I don't know that. I don't know that. It's public hearing because if you recall four years ago, there was a big they, 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 they wanted to have a big hike in the price and there were public hearings and you never attended. In 1975 to 1978, five Dover residents were interveners before the Department of Public Utilities and we spent three years on that topic. We have beneficial results, but three years on that topic. And you topic. know the answer is a yes or no, you need a public hearing. Oh, it was most public. You, I, well, but going forward, if... Oh, for a rate increase? The, for a rate increase. Oh, yes, and it, is a, it is a lengthy right. process. It is an open well, process before the DPU. So we have the authority here. Oh, my gosh, yes. Okay. So I'm going to ask the question that you asked. Are we finished? No, because no. we do have a few small items, including we have to but deal with a separate, no, separate no, topic. Oh, that's topic. Right. I can't see going forward further tonight on this topic. It's a problematic issue. We knew it was happening. There have been a number of instances of issue that operations have caused people to be very upset. They come to the board. We can't do anything in the current situation. That could be rectified with a home rule, but at the moment, 
we can't even introduce it other than use our influence with the DEP and, if necessary, the DPU. So then the way to correct this is to have a warrant at town meeting? Or? Well, I think based upon what the state has told us, yes, without question, it should be a an arrow in our quiver because one of these days it won't be just the middle section of the state that's put into a state of drought. You know as well as I do, it's going to happen again here. Maybe 10 years from now, I don't know. Because so the, the, the warrant opens in Because, I mean, let's face it, three years ago I spent considerable monies designing and buying signs to post when the DEP had declared a drought. And we ran into the question of, we can't tell you to stop, we can only say the DEP has told you to stop. And by the way, just for the record, the DEP does not tell consumers to stop using water. The DEP tells the suppliers to enforce that the customers should. You, you understand it sort of rolls downhill? Yes, I just wanted to ask a probably silly question, but other than if, because it's only a few weeks before the warrant has to be submitted, it's open, or it's, it's just open. open. It's open. What, when did you open the warrant? December. Okay, so our November meeting could well take this draft, draft bylaw, which the state has provided, and already supplied to Chris. And you're okay, already supplied to him. As usual, you're a step ahead of everyone. I don't want to put it that way. I just look at the entire strategy that must be addressed. I, you know, my only comment was to give you the warrant for all times. Yeah, no, you're right. It's a valid point. I think we we'll bring it up in November, and we will formally request that an article be there to uh, have the town adopt the relevant Massachusetts general law in respect to home rule. Yes, absolutely. Uh, speaking of regulations, I don't want to take a hell of a lot of time on this. I've circulated to to the secretary and to each of you, three different municipalities, regulations of the Board of Health relative to the permitting and recording the presence of horses and other animals. And I am raising this to you, A, because this year particularly we had an inordinate number of either residents raise that question to us or prospective buyers of property call us and say, well, what are your regulations? I have that in writing, by the way, each of them who have, and the response that was given. But with the triple E, it became very obvious. We do not know exactly how many horses are in the town. We do not know exactly where they are. We do not know for certainty that they are under the care of a veterinarian. And these bylaws of other towns, whether it be Stowe, which I believe the town has made use of as a comparative municipality. Uh, so they don't write tags like dogs? Uh, no, it's not quite that. But I will tell you, I had a lengthy discussion with the veterinarian for the Norfolk Hunt Club, and I was so happy to hear how he has now this year introduced a very rigid protocol of vaccinations for horses and for hounds. And the matter arose because when I had to deal with doggy dates, which you're, I'm sure you're familiar with, and the yard hearings and the zoning board of appeals who demanded that we tell them what they should say with respect to dogs, I was very happy in the discussion with the veterinarian who is also the master at Norfolk Hunt to learn exactly the protocols he had put in place, which actually with respect to dogs were a minor superset of what we had said. So yes, I think it's necessary. We need to know where they are. We need to know what the exposure is. I'm not suggesting onerous fees, maybe no fees at all initially, but at least recording. We pay 
one of our animal inspectors on our budget to be aware of this, but we haven't given that person the tool to enforce getting that data. So I haven't seen these regs, but I've seen many models of this yeah. through the different jurisdictions I've worked in. Is this requiring licensure of each horse, or is this requiring a barn license? They, a barn they license? Vary. That's actually the case, because if you, all you want to know is where they are, it's the stable that you're interested in. It, that's yes. what I've, most of the, because I've worked in Cohasset, I've worked in Sherburne, mm -hmm. and um, also comparable communities. And they typically, they typically do the stable license, and the animal inspector goes around with what they call the barn book, yep. and they document how many of each animal there is. That's the book. Not the and, individual license. And they don't the license animal. the individual. They no. don't license the individual ones. And they're. Um, it's that, not. It's not like dogs who are roaming free outside of control. We don't have an animal control bylaw. Just how dogs. I'm sorry, Dover does not have an animal control bylaw. No, in regard to that, it is rather the intent to have the tool to know where horses are, how many of them are, so as to be aware of who we would ask, have you made sure that your horse has triple E vaccination? Norfolk Hunt Club certainly has all of their horses so vaccinated. And yet we know horses went down who were not vaccinated. So there, there's that topic I wanted to bring up. Uh, we have the pending matter of C, uh, 105 CMR 410 in the housing court. I don't want to talk about it tonight. Felix and I have, and you guys have to get together on this and go further and come up with a stance on, on that. Just as I have talked. You need to do that. Yes, yes. I know that. We have to because it's pending. We've had some issues that have arisen, including a condemned house and the like. And I've talked to Christopher about this, and I pointed out to him in 105 CMR 14, the, the revised regulation, it isn't the building inspector. It isn't the board of selectmen or the city council. 64 explicit recitals of the words board of health and a number of additional recitals of the Board of Health's inspector. It lands here under state law. So we've got to be understanding of that. So I guess, I mean, guys, let's just get these it's, permits okay. out of the way. But I haven't done any of these. No, we started um, number three. We haven't done the upgrading. That's what I mean, the permits. Yeah, OK. The deed restrictions. Yep. So Mike had left these for me. He hopes to be, and I spoke with him earlier, and he hopes that he'll be able to come back on um, maybe Friday. Yeah, he and I talked yesterday. I said to him, what are you doing reading emails the day you got surgery? Okay. So first of all, we have 7 Oakley, and um, that's the deed restriction, and that was for a fast system so I don't know if you want to see everything just yeah I always do you know that yeah okay seven so this is a, going to be a deep restriction for a fast system and an Elgin system not common but that's what he wants to do and the reason for that is the following that the it's for nitrogen control and water quality so the FAS will take care of the nitrogen control and the water quality, and the Elgin will be taking care of the water distribution. Is this a new, new um, septic system, or is this an upgrade? What is this property, Septic Oakley? Yeah. It's an I old think, street. Yeah. Is this the first instance in the town where this whole system? I can't remember. I, I don't remember seeing it myself. Well, there's a reason. But, but it's a small it's, lot. It's, yeah. it's a third acre lot. Yeah, yeah that. so that's, so that's and, a nice And, transition. well, here's the real issue. The field is only 12 feet from the lot line. Yes, and, yes, and it's only 51 feet from the um, SAS. Yep. So there's, uh, so it's really a local. Where's so um, that's yeah, local, local upgrade, upgrade approval. approval yeah. Because, but it's a, uh, you know, so it's three bedrooms, and there's no garbage grinder, and they're both going in just oh, to keep track 
of the nitrogen. And given the size of the lot, we know that there can't be a hundred foot separation. No, so, only, so it's only fifty one foot. But they need at least is there fifty. Anyone aware of the problem when both systems are on a lot simultaneously? Well, Mike would have answered that, and he must have answered that because he's offered this to be. Yeah, it was so a failed I, septic system there before, and that's and it's just because it's nitrogen loaded system, yeah. and you need the boat. The, yeah. They they address different things. Um, I've seen many that have um, that have some variation on this over my years um, as the Board of Health agent. Um, it, it's fairly common in some of the other towns to do two different systems. It, it's, and, and the and other the other problem they have in this very small lot is they have very little working space because the property to the rear, the topology has a considerable rise, and I bet you it's probably would require blasting. Right. I'm sorry. Do, you, do you know if they're using the fast as a pre-treatment? Thank you, Robin. Uh, they're using the fast to control nitrogen and water quality. That's why the fast is in and the algae is in for the water distribution. That's how it's determined. Here's your blower. Determined. The blower, our, our, I see okay. a set of the plants. Yep. Yeah, see, the, the tank feeds into a blower that then, so that it blows back into the field here. So the date of the, the, date of the plan is, well, that's interesting. It only says September 2019. Well, okay, the... So you're, you, so Steve is, could you repeat the motion, please, Steve? This for is for seven, 7 Oakley? For 7 Oakley, yes. Exactly. The plan itself does not have an explicit date. It only says September, but Mike's approval date is October 11th of this year. And the PE executed his stamp on September, <coughs> September 20th. Okay, but I need a second. I second. Thank you. So I would say the, the date is All September favor. 23rd. All right. 